Yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks again also for inviting me. It's a great honor to be part of the faculty here. These are my disclosures. I'll speak about uh, three different optics, the best passive glenohumeral range of motion, then also the, about the best stable active glenohumeral range of motion, and I want to plan and transfer this to the surgical procedure. I spoke with Bob that we do not have too much redundancy because uh, all these uh, offset parameters he already described. And it's interesting to see that all the different products that are available in the market have a huge range of the difference between the humoral of the lateral offset and, of course, the total humoral lateral offset. So why is this huge range? Because of the stem design, the inserter, and the head neck shaft angle. And uh, there are the different configurations of prosthesis available in the market. Bob has already shown this, the medialized humerus, so the so-called inlay configuration, the almost anatomic or minimal lateralized, the semi-inlay, and the lateralized humerus, so the onlay configurations. We wanted uh, in our study to assess the influence of the inserter and the head neck shaft angle on the passive glenohumeral range of motion independent of the design of the prosthesis that you have always in all configurations the same design. And we used the inlay, the semi-inlay and the onlay concept with a 155, 45 and 35 head neck shaft angle. In summary, there was the same passive total global range of motion so in all directions with a slightly but non-statistically significant increase from inlay to semi-inlay and then to onlay as well. What was clear that 55 to 45 it had the same abduction, but increased a deduction, external and internal rotation one. If you then go further to 135, there was an increase in a deduction, but a, a significant decrease in a deduction and external rotation too. So I think doing the compromise 145, if you want to come to here, to have external rotation two and a deduction might be preferable. On the glenoid side, we heard also you have different lateral offset. You can play in the diameter and the sphere. You can play at the base plate. You can lateralize at the scapular net, either through bone, as Pascal has shown us yesterday, or uh, by metallic implants. The most important uh, point of gl glenoid lateralization are the first four millimeters. Not only our study, because also others, the George Group has shown this, in all range of motion parameters, first four millimeters lateralization is key. If you additionally lateralize then up to 12 millimeters, it has only an impact and external and internal rotation too. To put it inferiorly, we already heard that it's important, especially for a deduction and internal rotation one. And the diameter has more an impact on lateralization and distalization, but it's not clear in the literature if it's really important if you use a bigger sphere in terms of range of motion. So in terms of stable active range of motion, we just speak about glenohumeral, and we all know that scapula thoracic is so important in reverses, but we'll speak just about glenohumeral motion. And the question is how much we should relatively lateralize, less medialized, or distalize. We heard about all these different uh, offsets, and uh, distalization is key. And in this study, we were able to show that if you put the base plate at the Sugaya point or lower, or maybe you have even an inferior offset of the prosthesis, you can avoid the conflict with a sensitivity and specificity of 90%. In terms of lateralization and active range of motion, several authors, especially also George's group, has shown that the global circumduction range of motion is significantly higher if you lateralize, especially on the humeral side that has an impact on the muscle loading. But there is a trade-off between uh, st stability and also range of motion and also conflict posterior superiorly with the sacromial spine. So I think, as Bob said before, I prefer to be almost at the anatomic lateralization because then I have no difficulties in refixing the subscap at the same point. I have the same tension for the remaining internal rotator and maybe for remaining external rotators. And we heard yesterday, although uh, Joe, Joe was not, uh, was not, uh, he was not okay with it, that there are better clinical outcomes with refixed and intact subscapularis for internal rotation. <laughs> In terms of the global range of motion, I personally use the, the DSA angle of Johannes Bard, and interestingly, if you distalize more than 70 degrees, there is a negative predictive value where the, the, uh, deflection decreases because over-tensioning of the deltoid. 
Lateralization also is important, the LSA between 75 and 95. So what I do, I calculate in every patient the offset, because a patient of 46 diameter is not the same than a 54 diameter patient. So I want to have the total offset in those patients, and then I have to know my prosthesis, how I can lateralize with the system itself on the glenoid side and on the humeral side. And then I can play, as Bob said, either glenoid side or humeral side to be at the anatomic lateralization point. Two-dimensional planning for me is key. Some cases even three-dimensional planning. And then I want to transfer this to the surgical procedure, either to print the planning out or use mixed reality, as we shown yesterday. Or if I really want to transfer it to the procedure using uh, PACE PSI or augmented reality with navigation. To address all these points, I think it's important to have semi inlay HNSA of 145, glenoid distalization, the first four millimeters is key, and uh, approximately lateralized uh, five to 10 millimeters, and refixing the remaining cuff. Sorry for that 10 seconds. <laughs> Another amazing talk. Those two talks back to back were just unbelievable. Thank you so much. George? Uh, great talk, Zumi. Um, so it seems like we're trying to come to ideal values that apply to most patients. I was curious as to ever, what, do you th what are your thoughts on determining preoperative factors like what rotator cuff muscles work, what rotator cuff muscles don't work, and based on their soft tissues, then picking an ideal position for each individual patient? Yes. So th not about lateralization. I think if you do not have internal rotations, for instance, then I... I personally switched uh, the humeral torsion because I think I increase internal rotation if I give less retro torsion if I have a defect, defect subscapularis, I think if this uh, answers your question. In terms of lateralization, I try to be anatomic, right? Like the question that you asked before, I try to go on the intermediate glenoid plane and then I lateralize at the anatomic position. Did it answer the question or not? No. No, but it's okay. <laughs> Evan, why don't you take over? I think Joe fell asleep. Um, excellent talk. I'm still trying to process it. It was uh, very, very well put together. I'd like 10 more minutes on that one. Um, I guess we're coming to questions. So the, the question I have for you is, at the time of surgery, do you adjust your plan based upon any type of impingement, and how do you assess that, or do you simply just execute your plan from your 3D plan? Yes, I, I try to execute my plan, which is, not, honestly speaking, not always possible, of course, but I try to execute my plan, and as Bob said, I really individually plan on the patients. If I have an old lady comorbid, as Pascal said, with the 4B and even 5 uh, acromions, then I try to distalize less uh, in order to avoid this uh, these this problems. Do, does anyone have quick guidance for assessing intraoperative impingement that would cause you to change something? Anybody or? Anybody. Audience, audience, anyone have well, a suggestion? Anyone on the panel, I, I mean, audience. I'll, I'll take some I guess your question, people. Evan, yeah. is, is that you I've do had. a passive range of motion intraoperative once you've put your trial implants yeah. in and you identify impingement, what would you do to change that? Do you ever do anything to change it? And, and what are you identifying as impingement? So it, we're using these intraoperative sensors now in the polyethylene trials, and you can actually see when contact is, is being made, it changes the forces that you can appreciate on the screen, and you can see that there's a, uh, a change in the, in, the, in the number that you see on the screen when contact is being made, whether it's bony or soft tissue, and it could trigger you to change the offset of your glenoid component to get further away so you're not pinching as much. So that's, that's one of the tools that we're using intraoperatively to try to, to answer that question. I can, Evan, I mean, so for me, uh, getting to like what we had talked about, that at some level, if you're conflicting the humerus and the glenoid, you're always going to have impingement because it's, so, that it's not like you can continuously move the shoulder beyond the glenoid. So changing things, you can alter things if you don't like that range of motion. But I think what is most kind of troubling is if you have subacromial impingement because at that point, the question is whether or not that patient is going to be symptomatic. And that's the thing that I'm unclear with, because intraoperatively, if you have subacromial impingement, 
the scapula is fixed to the, because it's, it's, it's not moving anywhere because it's fixed to the bed. So my question is, uh, post-operatively, will subacromial impingement that you see intra-op, is that going to play out as a post-operative problem once the patient's scapula is able to move normally and probably a lot of the motion that we see in a reverse shoulder replacement is going to come through the scapula versus coming through the glenohumeral joint. So I don't know. I mean, we were talking, Marcus is here and we were talking a little bit. His partner had seen, he had seen in his partner subacromial impingement with a 135 neck shaft angle. Um, maybe, uh, you know, other people with more experience with a uh, more lateralized implant, again, um, might have better a better idea whether subacromial impingement intra-op then will lead to post-operative problems. Great talk. Um, I understand the concept of inlay implant, onlay implant. I'm not sure I'm perfectly understanding the semi-inlay. Is there a difference between the inlay where you just increase the thickness of the polyethylene? So the inlay concept, I think that the metaphysis is completely lie in the bone and the onlay is on the bone. And there are, there are prostheses where parts of it are in the bone and on the bone. But on the other hand, you are right. The question is if the center of rotation or the pivot point at the end is inserted, so in the metaphysis or out of the metaphysis. To my knowledge, this not, ha not, has not been addressed so far, but you're right. You can lateralize by using thicker polyethylenes any of these prosthesis designs. Do you think we should go away from the names inlay and onlay then? Like, we, it doesn't make sense to <clears throat> call something inlay and onlay when we can do the same with both. Do you think we should actually be describing implants based on the depth of the polyethylene now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so, I think we so should, maybe we should, we, we, we should agree on speaking about insert or whatever, but yeah. uh, I completely agree because we get completely confused because we can change any design in the, into the other. Yeah? Sure. Great discussion. We want to stay on schedule. We have a poll up for the best talk of this session. Now, we'll be starting the next session in a second. I, I hope the authors of the next session all realize their talks are five minutes. So we're not gonna have, we're not gonna have judges after your talks, and then at the end for the 10 minute Q&A, we will vote in the best of the f talk of the five talks, just to stay on schedule. Hope you're okay with that. If not, it's too bad. <clears throat> all right, how's the poll looking? I can't see it. Oh, all right. <clears throat> well, that means the fellow won because, gosh, that's unbelievable, Steve. 